You are about to listen to the audio podcast from Center for Spiritual Living. If you find value in what you receive here, please consider supporting us. It's pretty easy to do so. All you have to do is go to our website, csLftl.org and press the contribute button. That's csLftl.org. Thank you for listening, and may all the good that you share with us return right back to your life, multiplied abundantly. Gay as my husband is because he sings show tunes in the car. So I'm not that gay. But you don't forget your first Broadway show. A friend took me to New York for the very first time when I was about 20 years old, and I was absolutely mesmerized by the chaotic energy of that city and then walking around like some starry-eyed kid, you know, running into people because I'm looking at the buildings upstairs, you know, all those big tall buildings and little did I know that my friend had purchased at the skyrocket price of $25 tickets to a Broadway show, my very first one. It was called The Act and Liza Minnelli was in it, a Candor and Ebb musical written especially for her, directed by, get this, Martin Scorsese and costumed by the iconic 70s fashion designer Halston. It was pretty much a one-woman show. In fact, Liza hardly ever left the stage. At one point, she's standing center stage, and she's dancing in this little black leotard, and she's singing, and she stops mid-stage, and she throws her hand straight up into the air, and what descends from the ceiling is this red sequin Halston gown, and it just falls straight on her, perfectly draped on her body. She zips it up the back, and then she goes out and begins and continues her song. It was (laughs) jaw-dropping, honestly. I'm like, oh my God, what just happened? Watching Liza dancing and singing in that Halston gown at the Majestic Theater was a moment that I will never forget. I mean, as I said, I'm not that gay. But girl, that performance, that was life-changing. Big performances do that. I mean, think back to one that you've been to or you've seen on TV that was really iconic, like like the first time that Michael Jackson moonwalked across the stage or that Live in La Vida Loca presentation that Ricky Martin did on TV and the very first time that Beyonce paraded across the stage in her heels singing all the single ladies, all the single ladies. Of course, these things are generational. For some people, it might be Frank Sinatra. For others, it might be, oops, I did it again, Britney Spears. But if you've had the good fortune to be in the room live, watching one of these extraordinary performances, you can feel the energy of the crowd. When I went to a Bruno Mars concert a couple years ago, I could feel the heartbeat of the tens of thousands of people in that auditorium, all of us connected together, heart to heart, soul to soul, singing and dancing and reveling in the joy of that moment. That's why we love going to concerts and plays, because all of our differences are immediately stripped away. We're not Democrats, we're not Republicans, we're not Christians, Jews, Muslims. It doesn't matter whether you showed up at that place in a Rolls Royce or you took a bus to get there. In that time, in that moment, we're all one. One. That feeling of oneness is what I feel every single time Daniel sings that song, One Power every single time. It takes me out of my head and all the monkey chatter that goes on there, and it opens my heart. This is what our music is supposed to do here at CSL. Our music director works very diligently to create music every single week that uplifts and inspires you. The music is the call home to come back to your heart's center and feel the oneness of spirit It is a reminder that this world of separation is an illusion. And as much as it does to try to convince you that one class is better than the other or that one party is right and the other is wrong, in our heart of hearts, we know we are all one. Every party is right. Every person is valid. Every religion points to the same truth. All of us are born in spirit. Every person is valid. All of us are already loved. 
One of the things that I advise people to do <clears throat> when you are struggling with your own enlightenment and working on your issues is to get a prayer partner and to work with that prayer partner for as long as you can and share with each other your heart, your soul, your challenges. I have a prayer partner. I have a good friend and a colleague of mine, Dr. Edward Fulyun. He's my prayer partner. We have been prayer partners for at least the last 10 years. Every Saturday night, we meet. And we talk about all the challenges that face our lives. We talk about all the joys in our lives. And then we do prayer work together. So I know all of his stories, most of which I cannot tell you. <clears throat> but I can tell you this one. My friend Edward... He's about 60 years old. He grew up in South Africa during the apartheid system. He is a white South African, so he had all the privileges that black people did not. Early on in his childhood, this disturbed him. He knew this wasn't right. And so he would ask the teachers in his class why all the black children are sitting in the back of the room. Well, let's just say they indoctrinate you early in the apartheid system, and his questions were not met with kind answers. One Saturday night, he was telling me this horrific story of when he was a young man and he's about to board a train, so he gets on the cars at the front of the train, the whites only section, which are clearly labeled, and they're not really very crowded. Behind them, of course, are the cars that are jam packed and overcrowded with black people. And just as his train was about to leave the station, he looks out the window, just as the doors were about to close, he sees a man on the platform and the guy is running for the train, right? Running for the train, trying to get it, and he just made it. Right before the final closing of the doors, he sticks his hand in to pry them open, to make them open, and he jumps on the train. There's a problem. There's a big problem. The man was black and he had mistakenly entered the whites only car of the train. It didn't take long, within seconds, the police show up, they're on the train, and they start beating the man with their clubs, beating him again and again and again until he's lying there on the floor in the train bleeding. That'll teach you, the cop said. And Edward sat in his seat, frozen, He looked the other way because he couldn't stand to watch. When it was all over, he looked at the other white passengers around the car sitting there, all of them staring straight ahead, ignoring what just happened. He didn't want to cause a scene. He didn't want to create trouble. And so he sat there. In silent shame. And he would live with that shame. For a long time. For many, many years. The shame of doing nothing. In the face of injustice. And when he told me this story in a private conversation years ago, I said, Edward, you have to write that story. You have to tell people that the world needs to know. And a few years later, he did. He wrote a book called Ordinary Goodness. And in that book, this is what he wrote. When I finally admitted to myself that on that train and in other situations of injustice or cruelty, I had knowingly chosen to look the other way. I experienced an awakening. I started to see how fear and the need to fit in had fueled the choices I had made. Fear and the need to fit in. Something we've all had to deal with on our own. How many times have you seen an injustice done to someone else and said nothing and done nothing? How many times have you looked the other way when you see a homeless person 
on the street. How many times have you listened to people use discriminatory words about ethnic minorities or heard someone tell jokes about a fag and you didn't speak up to challenge their ignorance? Fear and the need to fit in will harm you. It will hurt your soul. It will haunt you in the night. The voice inside your head will say to you, you have forsaken me again. But why does it do that? Because there's an inner knower inside your heart and your soul, something in you that knows at the heart level, we are all connected. Something in you that knows the truth that we are all one, that there is one power, one people, one spirit. In our book of the month, For the Love of God, Rabbi Harold Kushner wrote this. When people ask me, where is God? I tell them I'd rather rephrase the question to when is God. Encountering God is not a matter of being in the right place, but of doing the right thing. Look, I have to be honest with you. I am not here to judge you. I am just as guilty as you are when it comes to not always doing the right thing. Like my friend Edward, I hear the voice of ego that says, let somebody else take care of this. Don't get involved. You know when I hear that voice the most? It's at the most common of experiences. I hear it at the grocery store. Every time I load groceries in my car, you know what? That voice says, my not wanting to be inconvenienced ego, you know what it says? Just put the cart over there. Just, just push it over there. Oh, put it in the handicap space. That's where everybody's putting their carts, right? You should just do that because you're in a hurry. You should get in your car. Don't worry. Someone else will take care of it. I don't do that. In fact, if you ever see me at the grocery store, you'll know that I never do that. I always take the cart back in the parking lot where they are gathered. Why do I do that? Because I really hate coming to the grocery store and you're looking for a parking space and you find an open space, but then you pull in and there's a cart there. So you got to pull out. And I don't want anybody else to have that experience. So I'm treating others as I want to be treated. I'm giving to them what I want them to give to me. And I know that's a small thing and maybe it's not going to change the world, but it has become my personal spiritual practice because it reminds me to do unto others as I really want them to do to me. Doing the right thing is never convenient. It is never the convenient thing to do. It is never the easy thing to do. In fact, doing the right thing is always the hard thing to do. Standing up for yourself or for another person, not letting yourself or someone else be treated poorly takes an immense amount of courage. It forces you out of your comfort zone. It makes you take a stand for your own power and your own worth when you say, you can't treat us that way anymore. We're not going to stand for it. We're done. Doing the right thing, the honorable thing, the spiritual thing requires you to make conscious choices. Conscious choices not to respond the way the ego wants you to respond, like when the cashier or the waiter is rude to you or the guy cuts you off in traffic because the ego's knee-jerk reaction is, I'm going to do to them what they did to me. You're rude to me, I'm going to be rude to you. You cut me off, I'm going to cut you off because it says in the Bible, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So you're going to get. It also happens to say love your neighbor as you love yourself. 
since doing the right thing is so inconvenient and so difficult, let me see if I can incentivize this for you. Let me see if I can convince you that doing the right thing is actually profitable for you, then maybe you'll be encouraged to do it a little more. See, here's the thing. That golden rule, you know, that you were taught when you were a kid, to treat others as you want to be treated, it seems like it's such a nice little thing to say, isn't it? Oh, it's very sweet. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But do you know that that's not a sweet little nicety? That's actually a warning label. Because spiritual law dictates that whatever it is that you do to someone else will be done to you. Will be done to you. What you give out always returns right back to you. It's karma, baby. And karma, oh, she's a mother. Karma, <laughs> she is a mother. She's going to get you. So what you give to others will be given to you. What you withhold from others will be held, withheld from you. So return the grocery cart. Be kind to the waitress. Say hello to the homeless man. And call your mother. And for those of you who find it easy to do this, to take care of other people because you're people pleasers, but when it comes to yourself, not so much, do this. Buy the expensive outfit and wear it. Take yourself, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for noticing. Take yourself out on a date. Go to a good restaurant, not a drive through Learn to love and care for yourself because in so doing, you honor your creator. You're saying to the universe, I am worthy of love. I am worthy of good. And when you do that, more good starts to come back to you the same way that you put it out because that's the way the universe works. What you send out, and I do mean everything you send out, always, always, always comes back to you. Love. The healer. The attractor, the answer. I started my ministry because I was in love with spirit. And I wanted to share my spiritual journey with other people. About 10 years into it, I watched it. It took 10 years to get 100 people. 10 years. I stood up on stage one Sunday and it became obvious that I had a room full of adoring fans. My ego was bursting. Like one of those performers on stage that we like so much, on Sundays I could see by the look on their faces that they loved themselves some Chris Michaels. So one Sunday I stood up there and I said to them, I get it that you love me. And I really appreciate that. Now love each other. Love each other. You see, I didn't found the first church of Chris Michaels. I founded a center for spiritual living. A place where you could find others who are like-minded. Other people to practice the spiritual principles that you were working on yourself. A place where you could meet new friends and positive people. A place where you could find the love in yourself that you have spent so much time trying to find out there. We are a spiritual community, a gathering place for like-minded people, a heart-centered, wisdom-guided group of people who are intent on changing this world, sometimes through our big efforts, but mostly by everyday acts of just doing the right thing. And so ends the lesson.